All right, just going to do a video refuting some of the non-dispensational heresies by Stephen Anderson, the founder of the Faithful Word Baptist Church, new IFB cult over in Tempe, Arizona. And he goes through the typical, uh, typical non-dispensational arguments that, oh, you know, salvation has always been by faith alone and that, you know, Romans 4 proves that and whatever. It's like, it's ridiculous. And I refuted it before in other videos. And proving that this this heresy that salvation's always been by faith alone, it will always be by faith alone. It's uh, it's not scriptural. It's just another non-dispensational false doctrine. But gonna show the video that Anderson. Oops, sorry about that. Had a weird glitch on the OBS recorder. But anyway, like I said, uh, I'm gonna show you the video that Anderson, where he he espouses this non-dispensational heresy. So let me just make sure that the volume is high enough. Because last time I did this, it was not high enough. All right, let's play the video. Romans chapter four, verse five, the Bible reads, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And what I want to point out here is that the Bible is talking about a guy who worketh not. This guy is not doing works, but he does believe on him that justifieth the ungodly. The Bible says his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now this is a common non-dispensational blunder. They try to use David in, uh, I think it's uh, Psalm 32, verse 1 to 2, trying to say that, oh, he talked about it, so therefore they were saved, but they were, he was saved the same way that Christians are today. Well, this is simply not true, and I'm going to show you proof of that. That, because uh, David is a typology of a New Testament Christian, okay, there is that. Uh, David is a type of a New Testament Christian, but he is not saying that salvation is the same as, as it is today. Let me show you scripture on that, proving that. Psalm 51, verse 11. Cast me not. Oh, let me just go up there. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Hmm. Turn to Ephesians. Ephesians. Where is it? Ephesians, sorry, Ephesians, chapter one, verse number thirteen. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So Ephesians 1.13, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but Psalms 51 verse 11, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He wasn't sealed with the Holy Spirit and saved like, like we are today. That's why he's asking God, don't take the Holy Spirit from me. But I, I guess, you know, because Anderson, he won't show that scripture to his people. So, uh, again, it's a common blunder of non-dispensational heretics. So, well, David, he was, he, was, he talked about being, you know, imputed righteousness. Yeah, because he's just a typology of a New Testament Christian saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And this goes to show that salvation has always been by faith because it brings up Abraham and it brings up David and it brings up us today as all being saved by faith without works. And another uh common blunder oh abraham he was he was saved by faith alone he was saved you know romans 4 talks about that all right let's see about that let's go to romans chapter 4 and see what, what's going on uh where is the scripture here it is so romans chapter 4 verse 3 for what saith the scripture abraham believed god and it was accounted unto him for righteousness okay now it's referring to genesis chapter 6 verse number 15 Gen genesis chapter 15 verse number 6 that's the scripture it's referring to Okay, but first of all, what did Abraham believe? Okay, it says he believed God. But what did he believe? If you're believing God, okay, what are you believing? He said something to you. What are you believing that he said? Well, turn to the book of James, the infamous James 2, beginning at verse uh, 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac a son upon the altar? Seest thou... How, seest thou how faith wrought with, with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, uh, which saith, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Okay, 
Abraham had to do a work. Some more proof on that. Okay, when it says he believed God, okay, what did he believe? He wasn't believing the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, give me a break. They weren't looking forward to the cross for salvation. That's a lie. Okay, what what was what was the faith? What was the belief that Abraham had? Okay, uh, Hebrews chapter here, Hebrews chapter eleven, verses eight to nine. By faith, Abraham, when he was called out to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Okay? So, there was some obedience he was doing. Okay? It was by faith. That was the faith that Abraham had. But you go uh, further down, uh, I believe it's verse... Uh, 17 Hebrews 11:17 by faith Abraham when he was tried offered up Isaac and that offered up Isaac and he that re had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it is said just go down of whom it is said that in Isaac shall I see be called accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure okay Isaac was a typology of Jesus Christ being, you know, the son being sacrificed for your sins, the son being put on the altar, it is a typology of that. But notice how it's saying that by faith, what did he do? What did Abraham do? Believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ? No, he didn't. Offered up Isaac. Okay, the faith that Abraham had was that he he had faith that God was going to provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Let me show you that scripture in Genesis chapter twenty-two. See, there's more to Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, than Anderson will show his people. He'll just quote one scripture and say, See, it proves Abraham was saved by faith alone. They're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so, they're being saved by Jesus Christ well over a thousand years before Jesus Christ even walked the earth. Sure. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse number... Uh, sorry, not, not verse number 12. Genesis chapter 22... Uh, trying to find the exact verse. Sorry, it's just really hot outside, and I'm just having a hard time thinking properly. Uh, the heat really kind of messes you up after a while. Uh, here it is, Genesis chapter 22, verse 7. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father, and said, "Let me just go down a little further." And said, "My father." And he said, "Here am I, my son." And he said, "Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering?" Notice what, notice what Abraham says. Again, it's a good kind of foreshadowing, a good typology of Jesus Christ, a good foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. And Abraham said, My son, God will, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went both of them together. You know, good typology of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh, taketh away the sin of the world. I think it's John chapter 1, verse 29. Okay, but you go further down. Because he's saying God himself. So he's saying, you know, where's the burnt offering? Abraham's saying God will provide himself. So Abraham, Abraham is having faith that God would provide a lamb for the burnt offering. That's the faith that Abraham had. It was not faith in the in the gospel of Jesus Christ for salvation. It's like, I mean, you're doctrin doctrinally mentally ill if you think that. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse number 12. Actually, sorry, I'll go, I'll go to verse... Uh, Number 11, Genesis 22, verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. Now, a little side note, the angel of the Lord is often a reference to God, to Jesus Christ. Okay, just want to point that out. So the angel of the Lord is, is the Lord himself in this, in this verse right there. Uh, verse 12, And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know, look at this, For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Verse 13, uh, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Okay? So again, like I said before, the faith that Abraham had, the belief that he had, was that God would provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. God would, would provide, you know, because Isaac was Abraham's son. Isaac was supposed to be, the, you know, the, the, you know, there there would be many children. You know, Isaac would, you know, be the seed of Israel. Basically, Isaac would, would give birth to the nation of Israel, give birth to Jacob, who would turn, gives birth to the nation of Israel, 
And Abraham saying, like, you know, God, you promised me a son. Here's my only son, you know. So he's having faith that God would provide a lamb for the sacrifice. And also God was testing Abraham, too. God was testing him to see how loyal he would be, to see that if he if he basically feared God so much that he would even be willing to give up give up his own son to God. So he was, it was testing Abraham as well as also giving a little foreshadowing to Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the faith that Abraham had. It wasn't faith in, in Jesus Christ's death, throne, and resurrection because it hadn't even happened until thousands of years later. Ridiculous. Continuing. So anyone who teaches that salvation used to be by works or something, you know, is blatantly disregarding what this scripture says. And the thing that's so dumb about teaching that people could have been saved by works in the Old Testament is that, well, if that worked for them then, why doesn't it work now? If that worked for them then, why doesn't it work now? What a stupid line of reasoning. Seriously. It's called, it's called rightly dividing. It's called, again, when you're not dispensational, you come to all these wacky conclusions. Oh, they didn't work for them now. Why don't it work for us now? Um, God was dealing with the, with a different situation back under the law of Moses. Okay, dealing with Israel as a nation. It was not the again the sacrifice of Jesus Christ hadn't happened yet. They're doing animal sacrifices. Read read Leviticus sixteen. Re Leviticus sixteen. The animal sacrifices were required to atone for sins. Okay, they cannot fully forgive your sins and wash away your sins like uh, the blood of Jesus Christ can. You can read about that in Hebrews chapter ten verse four. But they were required to cover sins. Again, there's so many problems when you get into uh, non-dispensationalism, which is also why he teaches he believes that Old Testament saints went to heaven when they died and not down to Abraham's bosom. So, just prove Anderson is living proof that non-dispensationalism is a gateway to other wacky false doctrines. Continuing. It doesn't work now, the same reason why it didn't work back then, because our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And that's what they were back then, and that's what they are now. And back then, no, there was none righteous, no, not one. And today, there's none righteous, no, not one. So, does it, well, back then, they're saved by work. What, were they righteous back then? I mean, give me a break. That doesn't even make any sense. It's never been by works. All right. So, here are some scriptures I'm just going to show you that Anderson would not show his people. Because it was not by works. It was not by righteousness, righteousness in the Old Testament. Really, let's see about that. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18 and 21. Here's a really good scripture that just totally destroys their whole doctrine. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18 down to verse 21. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn them from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will require at thine hand. So he's having to turn from his wickedness, or he dies in his iniquity. Okay, read Jonah, two, uh, read Jonah chapter uh, 3, verse 10. Turning from sin is works. Turning from wickedness is works. You know, it says in Jonah 3.10, For God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And what does it mean to die in your iniquity, die in your sin? You go to hell. Like in John 8.24, Jesus says, you know, you shall die in your sin if you believe not that I am he. So he's having to turn from his wickedness. Where is the mention of uh, faith in Jesus Christ? It's not in there. Let's keep reading. Verse 19, Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So again, warning the wicked, and he has, and if he does not turn from his wicked way, he dies in his iniquity. Why doesn't it say, warn the wicked, and, he, and if he does not put his faith in Jesus Christ, then he dies in his iniquity? It doesn't say that. Makes a problem with your thing of, oh, they're, they're, um, they're saved by looking forward to the cross. But look at verse 20. Here's a really, here's a really good one in Ezekiel 3. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity and lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. His righteousness which he hath done, Anderson, he hath done. And again, notice the thing, he shall die in his sin. And you have a righteous man here. A righteous man who starts living in sin, he dies in the sin, he goes to hell. They were not saved by faith alone in the Old Testament. Again, where's the, where's the mention of, oh, a righteous man you know, who, who puts his faith in Jesus Christ? It doesn't say that. He's having to turn from his wicked way, or he dies in his sin. Uh, verse 21. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, and also, all, and also thou hast delivered thy soul. So you're delivering your soul because you're warning the righteous man to turn to stay living, keep living your righteousness. Oh no no no! I'm sorry. Um, Ezekiel must have been you know 
an error. Ezekiel must have been Ezekiel. Ezekiel must have been spoiled by dispensationalism because you see they were all they were always saved by faith alone. So sorry, sorry, Ezekiel, you were just spoiled by dispensationalism. Guarantee you, that's what Anderson would have told Ezekiel back then when Ezekiel was writing this. Oh, oh, you're just being spoiled by dispensational theology. Ridiculous. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse number 14, down to verse 20. These three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They should deliver their own souls, but deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Delivering their own souls. You know, you got this little heretic Ed Fenninger saying, oh, it's just physical salvation. Delivering your own soul is physical salvation? I don't think so. Look at verse 15. If I come, noisome, oops, I just do. Uh, sorry, verse 15. If I come, noisome beast to pass through the land, uh, though they spoil you, that, uh, so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through the because of the beasts. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they should deliver neither their son, ne neither their sons, nor their daughters. Uh, they only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon the land, say and say, sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it. Verse 18. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they should deliver neither their sons, neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. So they'd have them deliver themselves. By by Jesus Christ? No, by their righteousness. Or if I send pestilence into the land and pour out my fury in it in it's right, it in blood, to cut off it man cut from cut off from it again, not good at reading on computer, it just it's not the best thing for me. Uh, to cut off from it man and beast. Look at verse twenty. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they should deliver neither the son nor daughter, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry again, I'm sorry, Ezekiel, you must have been just been spoiled by dispensationalism when you were writing that in, in chapter 14. Uh, another good scripture, Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 24 to 27. But when the righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, and commit and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness which he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Verse 25, Yet ye say, The way of the Lord is not equal. Here now, a house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Again, when a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall, shall he die. Again, when a wicked man turneth away from his wickedness, he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Sorry, Ed Fenninger, they're not talking about physical salvation, saving his soul alive. And again, he's having to turn from his wickedness to do this. Sorry, I just got some stuff in my eye. They were not being saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ridiculous. It's a false doctrine. Back in the Old Testament. We are saved by that now, but not back then. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 8 to 9. One more scripture I want to cover. Again, I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he, did, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, turn from your wickedness, or you die in your iniquity. No mention of faith in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection to, for salvation. But let's continue a little bit more. It never could be by works. It never shall be by works. It's by grace. And flip over if you want. Uh, sal you know, it's, it's by grace. Well, grace is always there. Okay, Noah found grace in the eyes of God, exactly. But grace is not the plan of salvation. Okay? Grace alone does not save you. Okay, God's grace saves you. Okay? But grace alone is not the plan of salvation. So uh, that's another argument from non-dispensationalists. Well, uh, they were always saved by grace. Yeah, well, grace is not the plan of salvation. God's grace has to be there for salvation to even be possible. But God's grace alone is not the plan of salvation. It's God's grace through whatever method he tells you to Get that grace. Under the New Testament, under this age of grace, it's by faith in Jesus Christ, not by your works. But he says it neither shall be by faith, by faith alone. Really, let's see about that. 
because again he's a post tripper he thinks he's going through the time of Jacob's trouble you got a little bit, little bit of a problem there James chapter 4 verse number 8 here's a good scripture proving uh, works in the book of James James 4 verse 8 draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double minded Okay. notice a few interesting words there draw nigh unto God hmm. they're having to draw nigh unto God Okay. What does the word of God say about being drawn? Are you having to draw yourself nigh unto God? Or does Jesus Christ do it for you through his, uh, when you get washed in his blood? Let's see about that. Uh, where is the, where's the scripture? Here it is. Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ, or in Christ Jesus, ye who were, ye who are sometimes were made afar off, were, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. But in James, they're having to draw themselves nigh unto God. But here in Ephesians 2.13, you're, you're made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't draw yourself nigh. But notice another interesting part of uh, James 4 verse 8. It says, um, cleanse, ye, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. They're purifying their own hearts. Is that the case now? Nope. Who, how, do, how do you have your heart purified? Well, first of all, it's not you doing it under right now, um, under this current age of grace. Uh, where is the exact verse? Uh, I think it's, that's, I'm pretty sure it's Acts 15. Where is it? Sorry, this is, this is a, this wasn't actually in my notes. This is just kind of a little side thing I wanted to do. Wanted just to cover this. Oh, here it is. Acts 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Faith purifies your heart. You don't purify your own heart. But James 4, 8, they're having to purify their own hearts. Hmm? That's works. Works salvation in James 4, 8. You know, works salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. Because the book of James is for Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. James 1, 1. James is servant of God to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Paraphrasing, of course, but James is to the 12 tribes. Here's a good passage on work salvation, another good verse on work salvation for the future. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse, or Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that, look at this, he that overcometh. The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. What does it mean to be blotted out of the book of life? Well, to be blotted out of the book of life, your name has to have been in there at one point. So, they're having to do these things to not be blotted out of the book of life. And notice verse 2, by the way, of Revelation 3, verse, Revelation 3, verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Another good scripture. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou, which thou, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, th that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. They're faithful unto death, and after it gives them a crown of life, they don't deny they don't deny God. They say, I'm going to believe God unto death. And that gives them a crown of life. Hmm. Oh no, but, but they're not going to be saved by, uh, by works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Really. Look at verse 11, by the way, of Revelation 2. He that hath an ear, to, he, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt with the second, shall not be hurt of the second death. What's the second death? Eternity in the lake of fire. But you have to overcome to not be hurt of that second death. Another good scripture because that they're saved by faith in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's never, it's always by faith alone in the future too. You know, sure. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 to 11. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, not just unsaved people, if any man, worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. 
and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that... Here are, they, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus Christ. Don't take the mark of the beast. They're not saved by faith alone in the time of Jacob's trouble. So Anderson lied to his congregation. Anderson twisted scripture. He based his whole heresy off just one passage in Romans 1 and doesn't actually compare scripture with scripture. So don't be deceived by Anderson's cult. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye.